Okay, let's check out number 14 here. The base is a region enclosed by y equals x squared, so that's a pretty normal parabola opening upward with its vertex at the origin like that. And then y equals 3, so we have a horizontal line right over there. And conveniently now, those two functions just create one particular region for us right here. So I'm just going to kind of shade in yellow here. What we have is the base of our region here. Gotcha. Now, we need to read a little bit further right here. Our cross sections run perpendicular to the y-axis. Okay, so that means that we are running horizontally right here. And guys, as soon as you draw that horizontal line, write this on your paper and circle it. This is now a dy problem. As opposed to the previous problem I just did, where they said we we were running perpendicular to the x-axis vertically, and that meant that everything here was a dx problem. Okay, I already see a little bit of an issue here. This equation was solved for y in terms of x. Because it's dy, we're going to need to flip that around and solve it for x in terms of y. Anyway, that's where we're at right now. And what are we drawing here? The cross sections run perpendicular to the y-axis, and they are rectangles. So what we have right here, guys, that I just drew in red is, uh, I'm going to call that b, it's the base of one of our rectangles. So the first thing I'm going to do before I come over here and start worrying about the three-dimensional graph is try to come up with an expression that's going to give me how long b is in terms of y. Now to do that, like I said before, we need to take this equation and flip it around. We need to solve it for x. So we're going to end up with x equals, well, pretty obviously, a square root on both sides. But remember, guys, just like in problem number 8 I just did, there's a plus or minus. Here on the right, this is x equals the positive square root of y. And on the left, that's x equals negative square root of y. So b is measured from right to left, and on the right, b is stopped by the square root of y, minus, on the left, b is the opposite of the square root of y. And again, minus a negative becomes a plus there, so b ends up being 2 times the square root of y. I don't think we're going to get any better with that. Now, in terms of the three-dimensional graph, I know you guys don't like this part right here, but let's see how we can do. So you've got an upward opening parabola uh, that kind of looks like that. And then you've got a horizontal line here that, of course, runs parallel to the x-axis, which means it's still going to be horizontal in this graph here, everybody. So again, in yellow, this is the base of your region here. Let me draw that one red segment here, B, which is still horizontal horizontal, and it looks like that. And that B is the base of a rectangle that now sticks straight up in the air parallel to the z-axis, you'll notice. And so that rectangle right there is what we're trying to come up with a formula for the area of. So let me switch to purple right here, guys, and let's start with something really simple. The area of a rectangle is its base times its height, but we need that area expressed in terms of y. Okay, so area is base times height, and we just took some time to say that our base is going to be 2 times the square root of y, so that's b. And h, how tall is that rectangle? Now, of course, this is a little tricky because in a rectangle, there doesn't need to be any connection at all between base and height. That wasn't the case with an equilateral triangle here. It's not the case in a semicircle. It's not the case in a square. Those heights are all fixed predetermined. But here, oops, the height could be anything they wanted it to be, but luckily they came right out and told us that the height of those rectangles is always going to be y cubed. Oh, okay. So that's that. And I suppose if I wanted to integrate this by hand, I could just make this two times. Now remember guys, this is y to the one half times y to the third. So that would be y to the three and a half power or y to the seven halves. That would probably be the easiest way to express that right there, guys. So now that we've got area, and by the way, we would normally say that's area as a function of y. There you go. The rest of this, finding the volume, shouldn't be that tough. Volume is going to be a definite integral. We said long ago to take it with respect to y of this function right here. I'll pull the 2 out in front. We'll get a y to the 7 halves. And all we're missing are the limits of integration, lowest and highest values of y. Oops, oops, oops. I like to see that from this graph right here. Looking from bottom up, guys, I'm going this way. This region begins right here at a y value of 0, and it ends right there 
at a Y value of three. That's the first time that three has really come into play here. Okay, and again, I don't think this one is going to be too terrible to do by hand. Anti-differentiating, we raise our power by one, so that's now Y to the nine halves. We divide by that new exponent. And dividing by 9 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 ninths times this 2. Looks like we're going to get a 4 ninths out in front of y to the 9 halves power evaluated from 0 to 3. Okay, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's finish it up. 4 ninths times, here we go y to the 9 halves power. Yeah, now I'm kind of regretting this. Uh, let's see, y to the 9 halves is y to the 4 and a half power. That's the same, guys, as y to the fourth multiplied by the square root of y. So when I'm trying to take 3 to the 9 halves power, I'm going to think of it this way. 3 to the fourth is 81, and then there's a 3 to the 1 half power. Well, that's a root 3 right there. Minus, okay, luckily putting a 0 in there is just going to get us a 0. And let's see, 4 ninths times 81 root 3, divide a 9 out, and there we go. And I think I've got my answer here of 36 times the square root of three cubic units, and that should be my answer here for volume in problem number 14 in 6.2.